and all the tens of trillions of dollars we need to spend. Get it done, it has a high return, in the end it may save our bacon. Should the Biden administration take steps to curb speculation in financial markets or rein in, say, SPACs perhaps, or Robin Hood? Yeah, they should, but they will. That's easy. <laughs> SPACs are completely, should be a completely illegitimate instrument. They're just an excuse for uh, people with reputation and marginal ethics to um, to raise a lot of money, take 20% of it for themselves for a quick dash around the country for six months. And um, a, a complete rip off in the sense that the professional hedge funds uh, then always liquidate before taking any real risk and take uh, uh, the premium that they can get and a few uh, warrants, uh, leaving the half of the marketplace uh, that retains it who put their money up on aggregate with a very bad return. Of course, they'll make some money in, in the late stages of the bubble. But if you look at the first six years, they have a handsomely uh, sub-average return for taking all the risk. No, they, they, they don't have enough uh, legal requirements, enough restraints, enough checking. Uh, they're, they're a thoroughly reprehensible instrument, in my opinion, and should be uh, um, disallowed. They, they should, of course, reform the IPO. The IPO is a license to reward the uh, fidelities of the world uh, at the open. Um, you could do better than that. Direct listing made a little easier would be the way to go. But SPACs are terrible. You've become a big believer in green investing, Jeremy. I'd like to know more about the story behind QuantumScape, the battery maker you invested in and which, somewhat ironically, went public via a SPAC merger. It, it, it's full of ironies. Um, and I, I hated SPACs long before I, I found myself owning one. Uh, but it wasn't just owning one, it was owning slightly the biggest investment uh, of my life. And uh, One that's that, made you hundreds of millions of dollars, as I understand it. Well, a whole lot less now. Uh, the stock has come down from 130 to, uh, uh, to 54 uh, in, in, in a month, uh, which is, by the way, a typical precursor of a bubble breaking. If you're looking for the very early warning signs of a bubble breaking, you find the stocks that have done the best, uh, SPACs and, and particular SPACs and Tesla and, and, and uh, Bitcoin. And, and you wait until they start to have these big daily drops and then they recover and they drop and they recover. Uh, and, and, and that's the very early warning. And the market in 2000, for example, didn't go together. Uh, they took out the pet.coms and shot them. The rest of the market continued to go up. It, it didn't even deign to notice the shooting of those little guys. They were only worth scores of millions or a couple of hundred million. Then they took out the junior growth stocks and shot them and the market kept going up. And then they took the medium growth stocks and shot them. And, and finally, by the summer, they were shooting the Cisco's and the, the entire tech uh, part of the market had been shot. And that had been 30% at the market peak of the total market cap. And yet the S&P by September was at the co-equal high of March, which meant that the other 70 had continued to rise. So that is a typical way. Bubbles don't necessarily break en masse, but having, having sliced off the tech and, and, and the dot coms, uh, the end, then finally the 70%, like a giant ice, iceberg, rolled over en masse for 70 percent and went down for two and a half years uh, uh, by 50 percent. You've been concerned and written about the state of economic inequality for years. Tell me, what do you think is the right way to correct it? I think the, the nurturing of moral hazard uh, and, and management through uh, monetary policy as opposed to fiscal policy has been um, dreadful for income inequality because by pushing up asset prices you do two things you make it difficult to impossible for people to get on on into the game the purchase of a house is just too expensive the purchase of anything stocks uh, is much higher 
per unit of, of uh, dividend or yield than it was. So that's brutal. Secondly, the compounding, the long-term compounding of wealth is, is reduced. If you have a 6% yield on your, on your assets, you can, by reinvesting that, uh, you can double your money in 12 years. If you turn it into a 3% yield by doubling the price, um, yeah, you, you, you're worth more on paper, but in real life, you only eat the dividends and now they're 3% a year and you double your money in 24 years. So in 48 years, you're down uh, to a quarter of what you would have been and, uh, and so on. And the gap becomes ruinously wide. In other words, the higher the asset price, the lower the rate at which you can compound wealth. And if you're not on the game, you're not in the game, you're a beginner, uh, you, you can have great difficulty ever getting into that game. And by definition, it means that the rich get richer as you price down uh, the, the, the yield and you mark up asset price. And, and, and the poor get squeezed uh, because you're not creating any real value. You're not creating more production. And uh, government spending is quite different. If we can have, instead of writing checks to everybody, if you can write checks for infrastructure, particularly green infrastructure, you're killing two birds with one stone. You're doing necessary investing, decarbonizing the economy, that if you don't do, may be such a shock in as little as 20 or 30 years that it begins to destabilize the global system of civilization. It becomes unstable. Um, you have to do it. And you turn it into a virtue uh, because uh, many of the areas have a, a high societal return. If you put in an efficient grid, everybody benefits. If you put in well-insulated homes in every cold area of the country, the society makes a huge return. We use less energy. These are handsome returns at the societal level. How do you go wrong uh, by doing more of that and less buying of, of, of Chinese uh, stuffed dogs? Um, so I, I certainly hope that um, the incoming administration will have a continuous, um, strong uh, public spending program emphasized at repairing bridges and roads. That is fine. But doing a green infrastructure, wind, solar, storage, research, training, retraining of people for green jobs and, uh, and all the tens of trillions of dollars we need to spend. Get it done, it has a high return. In the end, it may save our bacon. I've heard you say American capitalism is too fat and happy, too conservative, too monopolistic. Is American capitalism in crisis? Yeah, it, it's not the crisis that comes over a weekend. It's a kind of rolling crisis that starts very slowly, a bit like bankruptcy, <laughs> very slowly at first and then maybe or, uh, very quickly at the end. But this has been going on since the mid-60s, which was the sweet spot uh, of American capitalism and the social contract, by the way. A, a corporation in the mid-60s felt it had responsibilities to its workers. It, it was on the cusp of starting a, a, a nice uh, pension fund, a defined benefit. It didn't have to do that, um, but it did. And it was a very generous, well-constructed, important program. Um, and and uh, it felt it had responsibilities to the city. It, it was working in the state and, and, and of course, the federal, the country. Um, all of that is largely gone, but it didn't go overnight. It drifted slowly away in the 70s, particularly in the 80s and 90s. And Milton Friedmanism, he has a lot to answer for. You know, the idea that the only social responsibility of a corporation is to maximize profit. Um, it's, it's a terrible business formula, uh, we believe, at GMO anyway, uh, but it's a, a shockingly uh, amoral uh, way to run anything. And, and, and we treat corporations as if they are individuals. And they have a lot of individual rights, which, which is uh, ludicrous in my opinion, but we do. But if you look at Milton Friedmanism at the corporate level, that's sociopathic by any definition. If you say as an individual, my only interest is to maximize my advantage, which is what they say at the corporate level, you're a sociopath, for heaven's sake. And, and, and we are not, as individuals, like that. A lot of us uh, do the odd altruistic act. 
and, uh, and those odd altruistic acts are incredibly important in the long run that a few people, uh, hopefully like Biden, come out of the woodwork and set a good, set a good example and lead. Um, that's the difference between an autocracy in the end and a healthy uh, democracy.